to geopolitics, geopolitical trends. My name is David Waralu. It's so good to be with you as always. Very excited to be here because the nature of the topic I would like to cover for you in this session, in this live stream here. So a lot of attention now. Of course, it's going on uh, just what happened yesterday or the day before, I should say, uh, with the Brigogen, the the, uh, the head of the Wagner Group. By the way, just FYI, guys, it was this guy here that established the name of the Wagner Group. So this is the deal right here. So Brigogen just took over after that. So anyway, uh, so with that... Uh, of course, all the attentions are given to the BRICS, of course, BRICS summits. Of course, what's going on in Niger with now ECOWAS, which I will do an update for you. But there is something else that is going on in Asia as we speak. And this is what I am going to be covering in this live stream here. So uh, first, I'd like to, like always, like to extend my sincere thanks to the channel's members, supporters, subscribers, all of you. And if this is your first time uh, on this channel here, please make sure to subscribe. I would truly appreciate it because that's how you're going to support this channel if you choose to do so. so. But i also like to give a shout out to some new members for the channel. Uh, uh, Tian the Contrarian. So, uh, And by the way, uh, he's become, he became a member now of the channel. And you guys need to check out his YouTube channel. He talks about energy and so forth. I listened to some of his podcast very informative so i highly recommend it for you guys and and uh, tian if you are uh, uh joining us here live just make sure to share the link with other viewers so i also want to give a shout out to ko Choi hoi he rejoined now for i think for the fourth time so it doesn't matter i'm so excited for you to be here uh, as a member and i appreciate your continued support ko Choi hoi thank you so much for that uh, I would also like to give a shout out to three supporters, new supporters, Tokier. I hope I pronounced it correctly. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, second person is Cheryl Wee, uh, W-E-E. -E. Thank you so much for being here or becoming a supporter. And the last person I'm going to give a shout out to is Harold Yu. Thank you for becoming a channel supporter. Truly appreciate it. So uh, we are right now at about, I think, 76, 78, somewhere around that. We got 20 of 22 members to reach that magic number of 100. And once we do that, as promised you, I will do uh, an, ex an exclusive uh, Q&A just for you. So one announcement I want to do, I want to share with you is uh, uh, I've been posting now uh, uh, some videos on the health channel. Uh, for those who might not be aware of it, uh, please check it out. Here is the link to the channel. Uh, for the, the the health channel and please make sure to subscribe there just that's a way of your supporting and i will have a professional health uh, 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 person coming in next week on that channel somebody you will be surprised so uh, i will post it for you and let you know so the second uh, comment i want to make about this has to do with the the question that i asked uh, on the community post regarding when I said, what's wrong with this picture? You all remember, right? So, well, uh, some of you hit the mark. Of course, uh, the Russian president wasn't there. and But I, it, it wasn't about that, guys. It was about just to engage you in thinking. I know somebody made a comment about, oh, I see everybody analyzing picture in the comments and making a joke out of it. Well, you seem not to understand there is something called facial expressions. If you educate yourself about that and understand about human behavior, you will understand the reason why I ask the question. So, But some of you hit the mark. For example, uh, I'm not going to give names here because out of respect for uh, one of you says Modi, Modi's body language says it all. Look at the distance Modi is standing from Lavrov. That is correct. See how Modi's eyes are shifted towards Lavrov as if he's worried about him. Definite tensions on Modi's part. So that is correct. That's spot on. The basic line, I'm going to answer it. It was the Modi's eye shifting. And usually eye shifting is an indication of, you know, I am not certain about this or I am not sure I can say the truth or there's a lot of human behavior. I'm not going to get into that, guys. Uh, but there is a lot about it. So that's what caught my eyes right away. 
and when I saw that picture, and I just wanted to share it with you. So no, and nothing again, nothing against Modi here. It was just a, just an observation. So, so today's topic: what are we going to be talking about? As I said, I'm going to be like I always do. I'll ask the three questions: Is a mini NATO in the making in Asia? Okay. Second question will be: Will Japan and South Korea be sacrificed? Because it's the obvious. You look at NATO now. So then. If we are to think in those terms, how this is going to shape the security architecture in the region? Because that is a fundamental question. And I'm going to tell you why. Because there are other dimensions that you have to, or other aspects you have to incorporate into this, uh, the big picture. Uh, it was one comment someone made, and, and I respect it, of course. I welcome your comments. I welcome everything. As long as it is respectful, because I will not tolerate that. I have no tolerance for that. But this uh, individual, put a, which is good, he's, he said, well, Dr. O, it's a mini, mini NATO. Another word, it's a small. Now, I, I respectfully disagree, because even as small as you may think, it could be lethal. That is where the, 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 the concern, at least for me. Yeah, it's not going to be in terms of, 30 Asian countries going to sign up. Most of them won't, except you have the, the likes of Japan and South Korea. And now I am feeling comfortable to add Philippines to the mix. Now, this is why I said earlier, you have to consider other aspects, they can, t dimensions. Uh, I just did a video. I'm going to release it for you about Indonesia. What just happened with Indonesia? Well, they just went ahead and agreed to a purchase of some F-15s from the United States. Again, nothing is wrong with the idea of purchasing weapons, but the uh, purchasing uh, fighter jets, but the timing of it and when you're getting it from. It was the same time when our Congress agreed to allocate $243 million for Taiwan sale for next year. And if you think about what's going to be happening in Taiwan next year, Anybody can tell me what's going on in Taiwan next year? What's going to be happening? Let me see your answer in the chat box, if you can put it there. If anybody, I know it takes a while for this, but but that is one of the, the reasons. So you have to consider all those dimensions uh, or those aspects that is for you to form an objective analysis when thinking about, okay, even a small NATO in size, still can create impact and manage uh, uh, to change the trajectory of Asia. Elections, you're absolutely correct. Jack Robert and Sam Stone, you guys are correct. So, and again, this didn't happen in a vacuum for our Congress to agree to allocate that, uh, that amount of money for the, uh, the uh, 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 weapons. As a matter of fact, I did come across another article from overseas and I'm going to share it with you here. Uh, I usually get the the uh, uh, translation and all this. I usually do it later. But let me see here. Uh, if I, I I usually I usually I get the pictures. That's what I do, and uh, just keep them for you. But but when I saw this, I thought in terms of what well, that makes perfect sense now. With the visit of the uh, Prime Minister Shinzo, uh, I mean uh, Kishida, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Fumio Kishida, and the, the South Korean President Yonso to Camp David, that just made perfect sense. So now you have to think in terms, and this is why I had to answer uh, that comment by that individual that, yeah, NATO might be a small in size or mini NATO, that is, but it's still so. Here is the, I'm going to share the screen with you guys just for you to see, uh, to see this one here. Not this one. Share screen. There we go. Yeah, look at this one here, guys. Uh, I'm sure you see it right. It should show up right there. So this, what it says here, it's Benjamin to the, uh, Benjian calls on Washington to stop, basically the translation of it, to stop uh, uh, arming Taiwan. This is what we are planning on sending to Taiwan. So, so and again, the reason I'm sharing this with you this way for you to understand, 
Well, those who say, well, they're just talking alliance and so forth. No, 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 no. You have to think. Uh, you have to think long term as to what is the objective of that uh, 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 alliance is. What is it aiming at? So when you have uh, Japan and South Korea uh, leaders come to Washington, to Camp David, that is, and Camp David, by the way, for those who might not know, is in the outskirts of Washington in Maryland. It's close by anyway. Uh, so when they come over there, you know, alliance for what? You know, even though, even though uh, most of the uh, statements, <coughs> excuse me, are released by the White House saying, oh, it's nothing, it's not against any specific country. Come on. We all know what it means. <coughs> excuse me. We all know what, what it means. The concern with all this is that now this is now, uh, uh, this alliance will suggest that they're going to be holding annual, this is the key, annual joint military exercise. Yes, other countries do that. But again, you have to think in terms of the timing of it, the scope of it. I don't know at this point what is the scope of those joint military exercises. I'll be keeping an eye open on it like I did from back in 1994, which I will share with you what I'm referring to here. Because this is what it's all about. And I'm going to take you back in a little bit in history for you to understand the background, because without understanding the background, uh, it will leave you a little bit uh, not in with, with clarity as far as why this alliance now, and I call it mini NATO, is emerging. So, so for the idea or the White House to say, oh yeah, those exercises with those with the uh, Japan and South Korea, we will be consulting with with that. No, no, it's a lie. We won't be consulting. We will be giving them orders. It's exact thing we're doing now in Australia. This is why you're seeing some analysis coming out of think tanks in Australia arguing for, oh, we need to, we fear China and the security of our country. I know. No, no, it's nothing but hypes. And that analysis will have to be tailored towards fomenting that kind of arguments. Because people, so not everybody deals with geopolitics. Not everybody deals with foreign affairs. The language can be very ambiguous and all. That. If you don't know how to read between the lines, and this is why I disagree with the analysts that they are pushing the narrative in one direction when in reality in the other. I will call them out on it. You know, I don't care. They get upset. They get mad. Who gives a damn about that? Because what's right is right. Simple as that. So... That's the way I see it. So I am reading uh, through the analysis that coming out of certain think tanks, think tanks in, in Australia. I'm looking also at the one in Washington. I'm looking also at the one in Europe coming out of Brussels and, Frank and, and Germany and London and so forth. You, you get the idea. So this is why when we say, oh, we're going to consult with Japan, we're going to consult with South Korea. No, we're not. We're going to dictate the terms. Same thing we're doing now with Australia and same thing we are doing and it's rolling faster with Philippines. Now, this is why I had to bring the issue of Indonesia purchasing the F-15, you know, and I'm like keeping my eyes. I'm going to release a video for you guys. Be on a lookout for that because you need to understand what lies ahead. So, so what this all basically mean, this conversation about the alliances and so forth, it means that the agreement will mark a new era in trilateral. Well, yeah, because there are only three countries so far. But I bet you will be the same process as NATO started. Few countries, then all of a sudden start to expand. I'm already seeing the Philippines. I'm already seeing uh, India to a degree, like I always say, and I will not shy away from this. India's playing both sides, and I will do uh, a video analysis about the BRICS and where India stands in all that because it's very, very important. I tell you this, guys, and I did talk about this one uh, on the other channel yesterday. You know, BRICS will lose its credibility if they couldn't resolve their own their own uh, internal affairs or internal challenges, I will call them so. One of them has to do with India. Yeah, the issue between India and China has to be resolved. Otherwise, BRICS will not have credibility. I've been watching BRICS for quite a while. And I feel comfortable saying now, 
it's now or never is the same thing for africa it's now or never because the world is changing geopolitically the landscape is turning upside down and now we're gonna see where the arrangements of the seats at the new geopolitical table is going to be and that will dictate to us who sits where you got the idea on that so so here's the thing and like i i mentioned in the in the recorded video that i released for you one thing i am very certain of and comfortable saying and i will stand by by it is that in terms or in case of a conflict japan and south korea will be at the front line no questions asked Australia will be used, of course. And Philippines, I will add that. No. Now, those those countries, do those countries realize that they put a target on their backs? And again, I am not saying they should be scared or afraid of. No, that's not what I'm referring to. No. I'm talking about the strategic vision down the road. This is exactly why we are seeing this because when i take you back to 1994 and i was aware of those uh, developments at the time and it has to do with the talks with north korea this is what i'm gonna take you back to into that so so here's the thing these initiatives the conversation about this alliance between the trilateral alliance that is it will include holding trilateral summits so it will be summits more talk of course at least once a year okay this one you know what i will be for it will be to give the orders to both Japan and South Korea. And again, don't get me wrong, guys. The people inside Japan and the people inside South Korea, they don't like it. So when I say Japan and South Korea, I'm not collectively saying about the people. You know, people are, they don't like what their government is doing. Like what they just, Japan did yesterday, by the way, which I'm sure you are aware of. And I did post it for the, for the community, guys the uh right here i'm gonna oh no i don't have it here uh the japan releasing the uh treated water from the fukushima Fuku, yeah fukushima the the daichi so so that is what i'm referring to so the idea of the trilateral summit once a year it's to give the marching orders to those countries second conducting frequent frequent this is the key word again frequent joint defense exercises once again if you, you you know you're gonna have to develop and i am sure you do i just want to make sure uh, that's like what i always used to do with my students they said oh doctor oh we understand this i said are you sure because if not i'll be happy to go over and explain it once again so so i want to make sure you guys develop that understanding of how to read between the lines the keyword so what it says in this, and by the way, what I'm what I'm sharing with you is the statement released by the White House. So, so conducting frequent joint military defense exercises, rather. So when they did the press conference and talking, they said we're gonna conduct yearly exercise. Now they're changing the term into frequent joint defense exercise. You know what it means by frequent? That means it could be more than once and schedule. So uh, the other one is boosting supply chain what are we talking about here because you all know what's in that area the whole south china sea and i'm still pro i promised you i will do a video for malacca strait because malacca strait is really a choking point for china i need to provide you an overview geographically but also the implications from a security perspective so this way you'll have a better understanding why and why there's trilateral alliance now is also aiming at boosting supply chain because remember both countries japan and south korea where do they get their oil from energy at least so big time but who are the main consumers of energy in that part of the world you got china of course and you got india so you can just see where the, this is why understanding other dynamics taking place makes perfect sense for you to form it's like a puzzle you have to have the right pieces then the other the key one here that i found it has to do with boosting get this boosting supply chains for semiconductors and other key industrial elements we all know what happened to samsung anybody knows what happened to samsung guys 
if if you know please type it for on the chat uh, uh, box for our uh, for everybody to know you know what happened with samsung if anybody knows and this is again this kind of stuff doesn't happen in a vacuum there is a reason why they're saying this also because we in the united states are having issues now with the chips because china put a limit or block or block a whatever you want to call it so because we're trying to intimidate by forcing other countries not to sell their for example equipments for the chip manufacturer china went ahead and started doing its own but retaliated now we have businesses here are suffering you know it doesn't get disclosed this kind of information won't be disclosed on uh, on uh, in mainstream media here so and the other element has to do with artificial intelligence why because they're seeing where things are aiming at so so here is the thing in my opinion this trilateral summit that took place which by the way wasn't scheduled that's another uh, 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 sort of uh, elements you need to pay attention to. You know, were they summoned to come to Camp David? I don't know. I can't answer this one here. When I feel comfortable saying something, I say it. But this one, I don't feel comfortable saying it because I don't know if they were summoned. What I know is it was not scheduled. That's the that I know for a fact. So, so the summit itself... Uh, aimed now at consolidating this kind of uh, uh, progress by the U.S. and its two key East Asian allies. Uh -uh, uh -uh. What is aimed at is ensuring that the allies, Japan and South Korea, will have to adhere to the U.S. strategic policy in that part of the world. Another word in a simple language is they're going to have to serve U.S. strategic interest in the Pacific. That's what it means. All this jargon, what they say in statements. No, 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 no. You say it's straightforward. We want Japan and South Korea to serve our interest in Pacific. End of story. That's what it is. So, so and, uh, and this is why it's important to understand, again, the background of all this. this oh, like I always say, this doesn't happen in a vacuum. Uh, the one thing that I need to share with you guys is understanding at least a little background on uh, both uh, Kishida and uh, Yonso. So for Kishida uh, or Yomori Kishida, you know, his political ambitions were stirred, you know, when he was a child in New York. Did you know, guys, know that he spent time in New York? And he went to school in New York. So he's very familiar with the American system. So, And here is what happened back then. And I dig enough. You know, this is why I say, guys, I spend a lot of time doing the research. This doesn't happen in a vacuum. So I am very grateful for your support and your appreciation to the work that I do here to share this knowledge with you. Because you won't find this anywhere else. And I feel comfortable saying this. I'm not bragging, but it's the truth. You know, I let my work speak for me. Simple as that. So here is what happened. A teacher back then when uh, when Kishida was in, in, in school in New York uh, told, uh, told the girl to hold uh, his hand because that's how it is in school back then. You hold hands and you walk in line, you know, two per line. And, uh, and uh, that was during the school trip. Okay. But the girl refused. And you know why? Because he wasn't white. That's how it was interpreted back then. So, so this one thing that stays with Kishida all those years prompted him to resolve to change such feeling in the world. I don't know about it. I don't know if I will go that far because if it is, I will have to challenge him on the policies because here are a few things that you need to know about uh, 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 Fumio Kishida. So, as I said, uh, he spent time in the United States. He failed the Tokyo University entrance exam three times. And again, nothing is wrong with that. We all sometimes conduct an exam and fail, and you just try it again. That's all. It's nothing negative here. Just to highlight some key, key things here. So, so 
another thing that is important about understanding about Kishida, he comes from a family of politicians. So politics runs in the family. So now he is an, a passionate. Here is the what I found very traveling. A passionate advocate for nuclear disarmament. Well, 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 I'll let you, I'll let you decide on that. So, so. those are some of the, uh, and, and Kishida, by the way, was Japan's longest serving foreign minister in post-war history. So, the other thing that is negative about him is that he is not particularly popular with the public in Japan. So, so they don't like his policies. They don't like. Uh, what he's embarking on right now. So, uh, what is the other? The other one is Yonso. That one has an interesting background as well. So, and it behoves us to know at least a little bit about his background because you put things in perspective. So, Yon Yon Sak Yo, uh, his politicians, of course, in 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 uh, in South Korea. He was known for being a prosecutor and, and the one who has helped in prison the two former uh, presidents for corruption. No. He also imprisoned the head of Samsung and the former chief justice of the country's Supreme Court. So the moment you hear something like this, you say, well, yeah, the guy is, is good working for the, the good of the people. But he's politically weak, in my opinion. And again, this is my opinion. He's politically too weak. I put him in the category of uh, uh, Prime Minister of Australia, Albo. I put him the former Prime Minister of New Zealand, Jacinda Ardern. I put him in the category of Olaf Scholz, the current Chancellor, and the Prime Minister of UK, Sunak. And of course, the Prime Minister, Dictator Trudeau. To me, those are all weak. You know, it's not about barking loud and, and sending horses to, to harass the demonstrators and you show leadership that way. That's not leadership. That is not leadership. As a matter of fact, you don't need to conduct yourself that way to call yourself leader. So, so in, in this case of the uh, 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 Yonso, uh, yeah, he might be good at that, but politically he is so weak. So. So born, born in 1960, that's when he was born. I, I looked at his bio, by the way. His father was a college professor and his mom was a teacher uh, uh, back in, in, in South Korea. So graduated from the National University and became prosecutor in 1994. Well, here is the interesting thing about uh, 1994. Uh, before I'll do this, I need to share this. No, that's not the one. Uh, in 1994, why is this important? Funny that he graduated, but also in 1994, this is when North Korea has entered into talks with the United States. This is very important to understand. Why? It's because we are saying in the press release from the White House after this trilateral summit that this is to counter North Korea. Because North Korea is getting closer to uh, Russia. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. It's nothing new about this, like I argued in the video. How do you think North Korea reached its ability to develop long-range missile technology? Because the help of Russia. As a matter of fact, North Korea now, we are very concerned that North Korea is attempting to launch a satellite, a spy satellite to space. Yes, they are. So what's interesting about all this? It's because way back, because I'm, I'm taking you now from 1994 and before. Then I'll get you back to 1994 and forward. So you'll have a historical reference point to put this in perspective. So about a decade or two before 1994, North Korea was trying to develop its missile technology, you know. And they did have a lot of failed testing and so forth. But they were able to do around the early 90s enough to deliver a nuclear warhead to U.S. territory. That is basically to Alaska and Hawaii. That is where 
back then and it was so the united states at that time it was under the uh, tenure of president clinton that's what it was so this looked at it as an extremely dangerous development you know and this is where i argue that if the biden administration why it wants to avoid if it wants to avoid a spiral uh, with North Korea that could lead into nuclear because North Korea will not bluff and North Korea does possess nuclear weapons. You're never going to hear this in a mainstream media. It will never be disclosed. It's not classified if you know where to look for the information. So, so if the Biden administration, this is why I was taken by surprise when Biden all of a sudden saying, oh, we'll be willing to sit down with North Korea without conditions. No, 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 no. You serve in a specific agenda because we have the upcoming elections and you wanted to soften the blow that we're North Korea because we know North Korea is not going to bluff. And interesting enough is that the statement came right after, right after the meeting of the trilateral. And we already know that we already made agreements, made arrangements with South Korea that we're going to deploy nuclear submarines and there is another arrangements that's been made with uh with japan and this has to do with the acquisition of nuclear weapons yeah this might my, my surprise you so so to 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 avoid this spiral uh sort of uh, confrontation into a nuclear one with north korea the biden administration needs to understand like everyone before it even Bill Clinton back then in 1994 tried to show, oh, we will be happy to understand the concerns or security concerns of North Korea. We didn't. And you're gonna, I'm going to tell you why that is so. So to understand that North Korea wants, because we don't understand what they want, because we never have an honest debate or negotiations that it, and why it behaves the way it behaves. So like I said, there is a precedent that goes back into 1994. And I'm going to share an image with you here, guys, for you to see. This is Kim Jong-un, the, the father of the current uh, uh, North Korean leader. So during that time, what happened back then? Well, it was the Clinton administration engaged North Korea. And I do remember the trip of back then, the Secretary of State, Madeleine Albright, which I, I have no respect for the, the woman. You know, she's she's bad anyway. Uh, I remember her trip and the negotiations at that time. So, so here's what happened back then. And now we're moving into 1994. The U.S. signed what well, we agreed to at that time, a framework. And the purpose of it was to freeze for, for North Korea, to freeze its nuclear program, okay, in, or in return for normalizing U.S.-North Korea uh, ties. That was the objective back then. Okay? The agreements, of, of course, targeted uh, sort of uh, uh, many of the issues that were at, 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 at the, on the negotiation table at that time. That the two sides, North Korea and the United States, continue to grab away. You know. But... But it soon ran into a problem, a breakdown, because those talks broke down in 2002. So, so here's the thing. Under the, 19, the terms of the 1994 agreement or framework, that is, North Korea, just listen carefully, guys, because you need to understand this background. North Korea agreed to freeze and ultimately dismantle its nuclear program in exchange for the full, and I put this in quote, the full normalization of political and economic relations with the United States, end of quote. This meant four things, you know, because when you do analysis, you have to understand, you know, first of all, the basis of the, uh, the, the disagreement, if there's disagreement, then you have to understand the basics of, why we need to sit down and talk then you have to understand the basis the basis the basis of the framework under which we're going to negotiate then you have to understand okay are my interests and yours in line as far as 
us conducting talks. So this is mean it meant four four things. Main one back then. So by 2003, U.S. led consortium will build two light water nuclear reactors in North Korea. Why is this? To compensate for the loss of a nuclear power, because North Korea was about to dismantle its nuclear power. Until then, the U.S. would supply North Korea with 500,000 tons per on a yearly basis of heavy fuel. Heavy fuel if, is what you use for to generate electricity through nuclear power plants and so forth. So the U.S. also will lift the sanctions, remove North Korea from the list of state sponsor uh, terrorism and so forth, and perhaps most importantly, is to normalize the political relations, which still, which uh, at that time, that time of the agreement of the framework, was still subject to the terms of the 1953. What happened in 1953? Can anybody type in? Let me see, guys. And again, the whole reason for why I ask these guys is nothing but to engage you here, not to put you in a spot, whatever. It's just to engage you because we are here to learn from each other. No more notice. What happened in 1993? I'm sorry, 1953. Major event in that part of the world. Indeed, pro Yancy. Indeed, Jack Robert. The Korean War. So the term that we reach at that time, we're still subject to the terms of the 1953 Korean War armistice this is why the korean war officially has never ended yeah it never ended so despite what we hear here in the west so moving forward both sides after the both sides will now provide formal assurances remember i am talking to you about what was inside that the content of that framework agreed upon so Moving forward is that both sides will provide formal assurances. That's usually normal in international diplomacy or international relations. We did the same with China regarding uh, one China policy regarding Taiwan. We signed the three communique acknowledging the sovereignty of China over Taiwan because Taiwan is part of China. And yet we reversed it, not in paper, in our behavior and actions. So. So this back then, it was formal assurances against the threat of the use of nuclear weapons. Now, and again, remember, 1994. For a while, things seems to be, and I do remember this vividly. I do remember it vividly. Because that was, you know, I got involved in uh, literally following up with global affairs and international since I was a kid. I still have my notes, literally my notes for when Ronald Reagan met with uh, Mikhail Gorbachev in, in Reykjavik in Iceland back then. So I put a note on it in my journal and so forth. So, so for a while, things seems to be working well or going well. In 1998, U.S. officials involved in the implementation of the agreement testified into Congress that both the United States and the International Atomic Energy Agency, the IAEA, which I don't trust. This is my opinion. I don't trust them, no matter what. I don't trust them. They can manipulate reports in no time. So, and here is the, here, you can read between the lines, the testimony in Congress that both the United States and the IAEA were, were satisfied that there has been, and I put this in quote, no fundamental violation of any aspects of the framework agreements, end of quote, by North Korea. So, so far so good, right? You know, here is where things turned, took a different direction. Moving from 1998 forward, after the testimony in Congress, but on its own pledges, Washington failed to follow through with what was agreed upon. 
And the moment we fall or we fell short, North Korea took a 360 degree turn because they said there is no way we can trust. And that's how things have been ever since. So the light water reactors were never built. The US led consortium tasked with constructing uh, them was in severe debt. Senators at that time, because you can you can find it in the uh, archives of the uh, Senate Hearings Committee uh, or Senate Foreign Relations Committee at that time. If you go back, easy to find it, guys. You go to uh, uh, U.S. Congress, you go to the Senate, you go to the year where the hearings were, and you put it under, you know, for example, uh, U.S. North Korea negotiations. And if I, I'll dig for it and I'll uh, send you a link. So. Senators accused Clinton at that time of underestimating their cost while overstating how much U.S. allies will contribute to funding them. Then you got hawkish Republicans in Congress derided the framework altogether for supposedly rewarding aggressive behavior. Is the same pattern we saw with two main events on the global stage. One is the JCPOA, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action regarding the Iran nuclear deal. And the second one is the three communiques with China regarding one China, two, two state solution, one China policy. So heavy fuel shipments were often delayed to North Korea, and that started to lead to more problems and so forth. And this, this is why more diplomats trying to try to negotiate the framework warned that it will fail and it could fail and believe it or not, it ended up failing. So we end up not removing North Korea from the State Department list uh, of the sponsored. It was until 2008, though, it has long met the criteria for removal. So then then few years later what happened six years later around the early 2000s six years later from 2008 to 2002 and that's why sort of uh, uh, the congressional skepticism about the deal led to a minimum interpretation of sanctions lifting which means basically there will be no lifting of sanctions that's that's another uh, uh, manipulative way of saying it. They couldn't come up. By the way, I'm reading to you or sharing with you the record how it was written. There is uh, just FYI to know for you to know. In Congress, we have what we call a conference committee. There are four committees, and I'm not going to get into the legislative part. I intend to do this in the course when I teach the government. But one of them called the conference committee. And the conference committee, its main job is how to write the final version of a bill or whatever that is, which means it has to be agreed upon by both parties. So, so that's why when you see some wordings like this, the minimum interpretation of sanctions lifting, another word is there will be no lifting of sanctions. So, so and this is why no action was taken to formally end the Korean War. So, because to me, this technically was never ended. That's why we still, that's why Korea uh, will not bluff. That this is why, again, we don't conduct any military operations. Uh, we kind of trade, uh, we trade, we, we, we sort of, we are very careful how far, but now with these decisions to move the nuclear submarine to South Korea and South Korea agreeing to that, because remember, most of the missiles from North Korea are within reach to where the U.S. troops, and we have over 40,000 there. So uh, Japan, you know, that's why I said the leadership in those countries are so weak, or the leadership is is so weak. So, so the formal, remember what I said earlier, the former assurances that the U.S. will not attack North Korea were not provided until six years after we agreed which is <laughs> it's a red flag so because six years after the framework was signed remember we signed that means we agreed in the meantime what all this happening to go back to the time of clinton administration you know unhelpfully persisted of labeling 
North Korea as a backlash or a rogue state because he was forced. That's why I always say the American president has no power. So, so then things took a different turn altogether, especially in 2002 when the Bush administration, the nuclear posture review came out. And if you know anything about what was listed in that review is that was listed in North Korea as one of the U.S. Uh, uh, as one of the countries uh, which the U.S. could use a nuclear weapon against. Yeah, we have it in writing. So and that just changed things upside down. So, and we all know uh, the history of like I said earlier, I'm sorry, I will take back the number that I mentioned. Thirty thousand is twenty eight. 500,000 uh, stations uh, across 11 U.S. military bases in South Korea. 11. So what would you call that country? Sovereign state? I'll let you decide. And this is where I see the pattern for Philippines is, the, is going this direction. So, And that's why you have to put sort of this trilateral alliance within its proper context. The media is not going to de detail this. Media is not going to decipher the complexities of the terminology. So, so, and here is where the concerns in North Korea, because North Korea now, uh, since, since we didn't follow through with our commitments, we've, uh, North Korea has always perceived itself to be in Washington's crosshairs, which means... That's why they are the one what they do it. But we also know on our ends that North Korea will not bluff in retaliating. So this is why we never conducted block ops. This is why uh, we decided to put other countries at the front line. Australia, Japan, South Korea, and soon to be officially, not officially, openly Philippines. So... Again, I did a video for you about why Indonesia went ahead with purchase of the F-15s. And even for Japan, when uh, I, I, I went through the record in the Pentagon and I had to look for uh, the visit of the South Korean, not Japan, I'm sorry, the South Korean uh, uh, president when he came over to visit the Pentagon. So that is where things get a little... Uh, that's when I realized he's he's so weak. He's uh he's just not not a strong leader. So yeah, he might be a decent man and all that, but in politics, it, it goes beyond just being a decent man. You have to really uh, be a strategic thinker, you have to stand firm on your convictions and belief, and you have to pursue the interest of your country, not at the expense, not to pursue your political uh, legacy or political aspirations at the expense of your people. And this is to me what leaders like Albo in Australia, uh, South Korea, Japan, uh, even Philippines, uh, Germany with Olaf Scholz, Canada, France, UK, uh, they, they just, they're not serving their people. Shame, shame. So, so this is where I see the challenges. Now, again, I put the question mark about Indonesia because I don't know what game Indonesia is playing. But also, <clears throat> excuse me, but also we have to understand that when you read certain analysis emanating from certain think tanks, they will be pushing the narrative. So, for, for example, in, in, in fermenting tensions, strategic one that is that, oh, Indonesia in this case needs to arm itself. So to upgrade its uh, uh, air, air, air fleet, the, web, the, the fighter jet fleet and so forth, so they can challenge China in South China Sea, when in reality, there is none of that. You know, this is what certain think tanks in Australia are saying. You know, uh, some of us here in Washington, think tanks are saying the same. In London, is no different. And, and, and I don't need to tell you guys, look just what is going on in Europe. It's been enough. The collapse of the England, of the uh, UK. I just released the video this morning. 
you know, you want to read, you want to find the stuff about it in mainstream media here. UK is on the verge of bankruptcy. They will never disclose that. Germany's economy. I, I will release a video for you guys soon about uh, uh, Germany's economy, where it's headed. And yet you hear the foreign minister, Burbank, saying, oh, China is a security threat. So there is not even agreement within the government itself in Germany. Olaf Scholz wants to maintain friendship with China because he's concerned economically where his country is headed. That's why he went over there. But the foreign minister and the economic ministers, which are from the opposite, they are not even in support of that. You look at now uh, 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 England, France, uh, uh, Scandinavian countries, Netherlands, they all, they all go in being pushed over a cliff. Even in South Korea with Samsung, that is the question I asked earlier. What's going on with Samsung? You know, the sale of Samsung in China declined massively. So this is where that challenge that lies ahead. So the idea of thinking in terms of of uh, uh, the, the, the mini NATO that I felt comfortable saying this because that's what I see on the horizon, except that it, it won't go far. It won't go far because regional countries there, you know, you, except you think about the ASEAN countries and still there is always, there has always been a weak link in most of organizations. It's nothing new, nothing to pinpoint at one particular country. When I look at BRICS, when I look at ASEAN, when I look at the SCO, when I look at the RCEP, you know, there's always one weak link. So, and this is why, again, I feel very comfortable saying now I'm seeing Philippines go in the wrong direction. For Indonesia, I, I am willing to confirm some information. And once I figure that out, I will share it with you in a live stream. So, all right, let me see. I'll take one question, guys. See if there is, if there is one question from you. And just to remind you, I will be releasing. Be on the lookout for, uh, for a video about uh, what did I say about Germany? Yeah, I'll be releasing that. And 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 again, those those videos, guys. I decided. I've decided uh, a while back now. Uh, these videos, I'm not going to keep them very short, concise to the point. But if you like me to elaborate more like what we're doing now, just let me know. Because I don't assume that you guys, and I don't want to waste your time, like I always say. I, I, Your time means a lot to me because I don't want to waste my time either. So, Because if there is no reception on your end, uh, there is no need for me to do it. So, uh, For the health channel, I'm going to be inviting a, a, a health professional. Uh, if you can just, uh, I'll post it for you guys. If you can just uh, hop in onto that channel when I set up the, the time for that. I'm also working on reaching out to two key individuals for this channel here. Uh, invite them for a conversation uh, that I don't want you to miss because those individuals are, uh, it's, it's, it's from academia and they are very, very versed into understanding what's going on. So I'll be sharing this with you. So. Uh, as always, guys, remember, I, I truly appreciate your support. Like I was, oh, let me see, because I said I will look at one question. If there is one here. Oh, Cyrus, let me say thank you. And by the way, last time I missed, uh, 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 one of you guys posted a, a super sticker at the end after I logged off and it shows up late. So I want to say thank you so much for your super sticker. Truly appreciate it. So. Yeah, so thank you, Osiris. I truly appreciate it. As always, of course. All right, let me see if there is one question here quickly. I'll, I'll answer it for you and and uh, and I will sign off because I have uh, a conference call I have to attend to. Then I'll prepare uh, some topics for uh, next week. And by the way, thank you always for your suggestions as far as speakers. I did reach out to Prashad uh, from India. Yeah, I would love to have him here on the show if he's willing to uh, come on. I did send one email one few months ago, uh, but I never never heard back. So he's busy, I understand. Uh, but I'm, I welcome your suggestions. 
always always it means a lot so I'm, I'm just scrolling down here to see if there is any quick question short one that i would answer and again once we reach 100 guys 100 members for the channel i will uh, i will uh Oh, yeah. Thank you, Cyrus. I appreciate it. Yeah, you wrote. Is it okay, David? Do what you do. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. So, well, as always, guys, remember, geopolitics impact your daily life in more ways than one. I look forward to seeing you next time. Bye-bye.